5. Things Fall Apart Later that same morning, I went by the office and told Kathy Randa all about Mother's Day weekend. We are done, I said. We are moving on. You sure about that? Positive. Kathy looked sort of relieved, then smiled a big smile and said, Guess who's coming to town tonight? Who? Paula. You're kidding me, I said. No, she said. She's in New York, on her way to Honolulu, but she's stopping in L.A. for the night. I'm supposed to pick her up at the airport. Wait a minute, I said. Let me pick her up. I don't know about that, trust me, I said. It's definitely over between me and Nicole. That evening, I showed up at the airport and waited for Paula by the baggage claim. I saw her before she saw me, and she looked as beautiful as ever. She also looked kind of stunned, to be honest. What are you doing here? she asked. Well, it's been a year, I said, and it's over. You're done? We're done. I drove her back to her place, and she was shaking her head the whole way, unable to believe that this was really happening. A year earlier, she'd warned me that she wasn't the type of girl who would wait around for me, and she hadn't waited around. But suddenly I was there, and she was there, and we both still wanted each other. We spent the night together. And the next day, I took her to the airport. We were happy, like a pair of kids. I drove home wondering why I'd ever put her through such hell. I was also grateful. She was being incredibly understanding. When I reached her in Honolulu later that day, however, she sounded a little less happy. I'm still hurt, she said. I'm sorry, I said. I did what I had to do. If I hadn't made an effort to keep the family together, I would have wondered about it for the rest of my life. It was a long year, she said. It was long for me, too. I don't honestly know what I want from you, she said. All I know is that I want to take it real slow. I was game for anything, and I told her so. I wanted Paula back in my life, and I made it clear that I'd jump through hoops for her. On the other hand, to be completely honest, I wasn't sure we could make it work. Paula was looking to settle down and start making babies, and I was done with that part of my life. I figured we could have that conversation when she returned to Los Angeles but it never happened. A few weeks later, Nicole and Ron Goldman were dead, and I was being charged with the murders. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. A few days after Paula left for Honolulu, I was in New York on business, and I got a call from Gigi, my housekeeper. She was upset. She said Nicole had just been by the house and that she'd asked her to take care of the kids that weekend. What are you crying about? I asked. That's no reason to cry. Nicole got mad at me, Gigi said. What do you mean she got mad? What right does she have to get mad? You work for me, and you're off on weekends. If you want to babysit the kids, that's between you and Nicole. But she can't be coming by making demands. Yes, sir. That's what I tried to tell her. But she said I'd better be here when she came by to drop off the kids. That's crazy. She's got no right even coming by the house when I'm not there. Don't worry about a thing. I'll take care of it right away. I called Nicole the moment we got off the phone. I was pissed, but I kept it civilized. Gigi works for me, and she has the weekends off, I said. You can't be hassling her. You ran Michelle off. Please don't do the same with Gigi. Nicole didn't apologize, but she didn't come by the house that weekend either. Two days later, however, when I was back, she stopped by to drop off the kids, and I thought I heard her having words with Cato. I looked out the window but couldn't see her, and I couldn't see Cato either. He was probably running for the hills. I went downstairs as the kids came through the front door and Nicole was right behind them, walking in like she owned the place. I thought I told you to get rid of Cato, she barked. I don't want to talk about Cato, I said. Not now, not ever. I never want to see him again, she said. Nick, come on, back off. The guy told me he found a place, but it fell out. Bullshit. I ignored her. I took the kids out to the pool, and we jumped into the water. Nicole watched us for a few minutes, scowling. I'm leaving, she said. I looked at her as if to say... So fucking what? Leave already. She got the message. She turned and left. I hung out with the kids and tried not to think about her, but it was hard. She was clearly deteriorating. Maybe she was upset because we were over. Maybe she was having a hard time facing the future. I don't know what the hell it was, but it wasn't good. I found myself thinking of that old cliche about divorce. If you've got kids, you're stuck with that person for the rest of your life. It was not a pleasant thought. After the kids got out of the pool, I called Kathy Randa. I told her I thought Nicole was getting worse, 
and that I didn't want to be around her anymore. It wasn't good for me, I said, and it sure as hell wasn't good for the kids. I asked her to please review the schedule and to help me arrange all future pickups and drop-offs. You okay? Kathy asked me. Yeah, I said. I'm fine, and if we can get in the coal handle, I'll be better than fine. I went back to New York on business and returned a few days later, and the next morning, before I was even out of bed, the phone rang. It was Nicole. I'm sick, she said. I've got pneumonia. Could you come by and take the kids to school? I got dressed and hurried over. She looked like hell. I changed the bed linens and tucked her back into bed and took the kids to school. Then I stopped at Froman's, a Santa Monica deli, to pick up some chicken soup. I took it back to the house and sat with her, watching her eat it. I didn't understand why she was sick. This was mid-May. Who catches pneumonia in mid-May? I just knew this had to be connected to the drugs. You're not doing anything you're not supposed to be doing, are you? O.J., please. How many times have I told you? I don't want to talk about this. The weird part was she didn't deny it. She has always been a lousy liar, so she just avoided the topic. I wanted her to talk about it, though. So did her mother. So did anyone who cared about her. Hell, Cora Fishman had begged her to talk about it. We all wanted her to face this thing so she could begin to do something about it. I wish we had tried harder, she said. Excuse me? During the year we tried to reconcile. I know we could have done better. Now this was something I didn't want to talk about, so I said nothing. She set down her soup spoon and stared at me. She looked like all the hope had gone out of her. In the course of the previous year, while we were still working at reconciling, there were times when everything seemed to be going completely to hell. But Nicole never stopped hoping. Now that we weren't even trying anymore, however, there was nothing to be hopeful about. And that's what I saw in her eyes. A complete absence of hope. For the next few days, Nicole was pretty sick. I ended up shuttling the kids to and from school and to and from my house, and Kathy Randa pitched in. But mostly, Nicole wanted me to take care of things. I went to the pharmacy to pick up her medicine, and I went back to Froman's for second and third helpings of chicken soup. And I helped her change the linens a couple more times. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to suggest that I was the perfect ex-husband. All I'm saying is that I was worried about her, and I wanted to help her find a way back. No matter what had gone wrong in our lives, and plenty of shit had gone wrong, she was still the mother of my kids. I was stuck with her. But for their sake, I wanted to be stuck with her. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Nicole was a great mother. Schoolwork, manners, appearance, she was all over those kids. The only thing I objected to was when she turned into the other Nicole, and that Nicole was still very much around, still lurking, ready to leap out and make more trouble. Meanwhile, Paula was back in town and I was trying to keep that romance going. It, it was strange. Not all that long ago, I cheated on my girlfriend with my ex-wife. Now I was cheating again, in a manner of speaking. I was nursing my ex-wife back to health and trying to keep my girlfriend from finding out. I still think separating was a good thing, Nicole told me a couple days later. We were standing in her kitchen at the Bundy place, and I was ladling hot soup into a clean bowl. I just wish I'd made a little more progress in therapy. You don't think the therapy helped? It helped, I guess. But it didn't really change anything. I wanted to get stronger for us so that we could have a stronger relationship, but that didn't work out too well. Well, you know, that shit takes time. I already quit therapy, she said. I didn't think I was making enough progress. A few days later, this is in late May, less than a month before Nicole's death, I was having a party at my house with the kids and their classmates. It was a little fundraiser for the school, and this was the third consecutive year I'd played host. I had clowns and magicians and those bouncy things for little kids, and of course lots of good food for everyone. The day of the picnic, Cato was on his way out of the house to meet some friends, and he stopped by the party to say hello. I heard the kids giving him a hard time. They were repeating all the things they'd learned from Nicole, that he was a freeloader and a bum, and I went over and told him to cut it out. I wasn't mean about it, though. I realized they didn't know any better. Nicole had poisoned them with her anger. Tell you the truth, though, I was a little sick of Cato myself. I'd already told him to find a place of his own on more than one occasion, and he kept assuring me that he was trying. It's not like he was underfoot or anything, though, so I didn't give it much thought. But that was one of those things that made it hard for me to understand the depth of Nicole's rage. 
She saw him even less than I did, but the mention of his name could really set her off. About an hour after Cato left, Nicole showed up in the middle of the picnic. The first words out of her mouth were, Where's Cato? I sure hope I don't see him. He left, I said. I wondered what she was doing there. But since she had often co-hosted that little picnic with me, I wasn't going to ask her to leave. You feeling better? I asked. Instead of answering, she reached up and gave me a little kiss. Then she went around saying hello to the parents, most of whom she knew from school. She was acting very friendly and behaving like the hostess and even thanking people for coming. I thought that was pretty strange. Everyone knew we were no longer together. Everyone knew she didn't live there anymore. I tried not to think about it. I went inside and joined some of the dads who were watching the NBA playoffs. A few minutes later, Nicole came down and dropped onto the couch next to me and asked me to rub her feet. I rubbed her feet for a few minutes, mostly because I didn't want to get into anything. She was pale and still looked pretty sick. You okay? I asked. Uh huh, she said. Just tired. I stopped rubbing her feet and told her to go upstairs and lie down. I said I'd stop in later to check on her. She went, and I thought I'd gotten rid of her, but within a few minutes, Gigi, my housekeeper, came by to tell me that Nicole was asking for me. I went upstairs, frustrated, and found her lying on my bed. What's up? I asked. Why is Cato still here? Why is Cato still here? What the hell has that had to do with anything? He's not here now. I hate him. For Christ's sake, Nicole, you're the one who asked me to put him up. I know, she said, but that was five months ago. He was supposed to work for his rent and he's not working. He's not doing shit for me. I keep asking you to get rid of him and you're not getting rid of him. Why are we having this conversation now? I said. I've got people downstairs. We're having this conversation now because I don't want him around anymore. I don't want to see him when I'm here. I felt like saying nobody asked you to come by, but I didn't. The whole thing was crazy. Nicole wasn't making any sense on any level. I don't like Gigi either, she said suddenly. Gigi, what has she ever done to you? What is going on with you, Nicole? Are you on something besides antibiotics? Why are you still giving me shit about that, she snapped. Because I'm worried about you, I said. Isn't that sweet, she said. But she had an edge in her voice. Man, I didn't need that shit. I turned around and left the room without another word. To be honest with you, Nicole's behavior was beginning to scare me. The party wound down without incident, and Nicole went home also without incident. But the next day I had Paula over, and we were watching a movie on TV, working on our relationship, taking it slow, when the phone rang. It was Nicole. She was screaming so loud that I had to take the phone into the kitchen. Why are you trying to steal my friends? She shouted. Steal your friends? What the hell are you talking about? You invited them to the fundraiser. Jesus, I couldn't believe it. She was talking about the sports banquet I was hosting to raise money for Cedar sinai for children with birth defects. The previous fall, while Nicole and I were still together, or trying to be together, I had suggested that she ask some of her friends to join us at our table. I had my doubts about these so-called friends, but Nicole had told me, repeatedly, that I was wrong about them, and I wanted to give her an opportunity to show me I was wrong. She could bring them to the fundraiser, and maybe I'd find out that they were truly the good, decent people she was telling me they were. After Nicole and I split up, though, definitively this time, I'd asked Paula to come with me to the fundraiser. I didn't think she would be all that comfortable around Nicole's friends, though, so I had to disinvite them. Ron Fishman and his son Michael were still welcome, as was Christian Reichardt, but I didn't want to force Paula to deal with the girls, Cora or Faye or any of those people, because I didn't think it would be fair to her, or even to Nicole, frankly. When I called Faye to tell her that the plans had changed and that I didn't think the evening was going to work out, she tried to set me straight. I thought Christian and I were your friends, she said. Well, you are my friends, I said. And what the hell was I going to say? And she said, then why can't we come? I tried to explain it to her, suggesting that it might be hard on Paula. And she told me that that didn't make any sense at all. OJ, we don't play that game, she said. We don't take sides. We want to be your friends and we'd love to meet Paula. At that point, what could I do? Fine, I said. You can come. So there I was in the kitchen, with Nicole screaming at me about the fundraiser demanding an explanation. I didn't invite Faye. I hollered back. Faye invited herself. Liar, she yelled. You're a goddamn liar. My God, this woman was crazy. 
One day I was an angel, the best thing that ever happened to her, and the next day I was Satan himself. I hung up and called Faye's house. Christian Reichardt answered the phone. I told him what was happening, and he put Faye on the phone, and I explained how Nicole had just gone ballistic over the fundraiser. Come on, O.J., she said. You know what this is about. No, I said. I don't know what this is about. This has nothing to do with the fundraiser. Nicole still loves you, and she's upset because you're already back with Paula. Who cares about that? I snapped. It's over between us. I can be with whoever I want, and so can she. I don't tell her who to go out with, and I don't care. And I wish to hell she'd move on already. Well, that's the problem, Faye said. She can't move on. She loves you. It's easy for you to move on because you don't love her. But she's still crazy about you and can't let go. I didn't want to get into a long, philosophical conversation. Faye, I said, I don't have time for this shit. I just need a favor from you. I need you to call Nicole and tell her that you invited yourself to this thing. You just do that one favor for me, okay? And while you're at it, please tell her I don't give a shit who she dates or anything else. I know that wasn't the nicest thing to say, but I didn't really care at that point. I was sick of dealing with Nicole's crap. And I had Paula in the other room, waiting. Well, the rest of the evening went pretty well. And that's all I'm going to say about that. The next day, as I was heading into town in my car, I saw Nicole and Cora jogging through the neighborhood. I didn't stop, but I called Nicole's house, knowing she wouldn't be there to answer the phone, and left a message on her machine. I hope Faye explained all the fundraiser bullshit to you yesterday, I said. If she didn't, you need to talk to her. I purposely did not invite her and Cora because I didn't feel comfortable having them around Paula. That's the truth. Other than that, please do not call me for anything. If it's not about the kids, I don't want to hear from you. That was the truth. It was also definitely true that I didn't want to hear from her. And that right there is the reason we weren't talking at the time of her death. Not because I threatened her, but because I'd had my goddamn fill of her. She was poisoning me with her anger and I needed to get away from it. The next day, not even two weeks before Nicole's death, Cora Fishman called and asked if she could stop by the house. She lived a couple of blocks away and she came over and she was crying before she even started talking. What's wrong? I said. You've got to do something about Nicole, she said. You've got to get her away from these people. Hey, don't you think I've tried? Then do it by force if you have to, she said. Run an intervention, but do something. I'm begging you. I'm sick of trying. You don't understand, she said. We had a big fight yesterday after we went jogging. Nicole is one of my best friends. We've never had a fight like that. She just refuses to accept that she's in serious trouble. And in my heart, I know something bad is going to happen. I'll be honest with you. I liked Cora, but I wasn't moved by her tears. Don't tell me, I said. Tell her mother. Tell another friend. I'm finished with her. O.J., please. Hey, I snapped. It ain't my problem. That was the end of the conversation. Much later, of course, during the trial and during those many months behind bars, I often thought back to that moment, and I felt pretty guilty about it. But at the time, I was completely done with Nicole, and I was responding as I saw fit. It seemed like no matter how much I tried to do for her, no matter how patient and reasonable I was, my good intentions always came back to bite me in the ass. So I was pretty angry at that point, yeah. I didn't want to see her. I didn't want to hear from her, and I didn't want to deal with any of her shit. I had done the best I could, and it wasn't good enough, and at that point I wanted to put some miles between us. Cora left the house, unhappy and frustrated, and I didn't talk to her again until after the murders. Much later, I heard that the problems over on Bundy only seemed to get worse by the day. Faye Resnick had an acrimonious falling out with her fiancé, and supposedly moved into Nicole's house on or around June 3rd. Then there was some talk about her going into rehab, but apparently she didn't want to go alone, and she kept insisting that Nicole was as messed up as she was. I'm not going unless Nicole goes, she kept hollering, even when they were taking her away. She's in worse shape than me. Like I said, I don't know if this is entirely accurate, but that was the story, and I certainly believed one part of it, the part about Nicole being as messed up as Faye. I believed it because I'd seen it. In a strange way, I was actually kind of hoping that Nicole would hit the wall. I figured she wouldn't even begin to think about acknowledging her problems or getting professional help for them until she was completely out of options. A few days later, while I was in New York, I got a call from Gigi, 
the housekeeper. I had never heard her so upset. Nicole was just here, she said, and she began to cry. She was screaming at me and cursing. What was she doing there? She came to tell me that her mail would be coming to the house and that I should put it aside for her. That's when I found out that she was still trying to con the IRS. She wanted them to think she had taken the money from the sale of her San Francisco condo and used it to buy the Bundy condo, another investment property. Only it wasn't an investment property, it was her home. I called my lawyer steaming. I can't have her coming by the house anymore, I said. She already cost me one housekeeper, and now she's got the new one crying and on the verge of quitting. So tell her, my lawyer said. I don't want to talk to her, I said. Then write her a letter, he suggested. We wrote it together. I told her I was not going to risk having the IRS come after me because she wanted to play fast and loose with the tax laws. I don't want your mail coming to my house, I noted, so please make other arrangements. Do what you've got to do, but don't make me part of it. Much later, during the trial, the prosecution tried to make it sound as if I'd been threatening her and that this was my way of punishing her for leaving me. I don't know how they got that from the facts, but it seems like most reporters never let the facts get in the way of a good story. I was simply trying to keep her on the straight and narrow. The gist of it was, you're not living here, and you're not going to live here. So you need to take care of this. If the IRS comes, I'm going to tell them the truth. By this point, as you can well imagine, we were pretty much not talking. On June 11th, I took Paula Barbieri to a fundraiser for a pediatric hospital in Israel. That Sharon, the wife of the Israeli prime minister, was hosting it. When it was over, Paula and I went back to my place and made love. I felt I had really fallen for her, and things seemed to be getting better by the day. The following day, June 12th, was the day of Sydney's recital. Sydney was doing a little dance thing at a school with a little classmate, and I was really looking forward to it. Nicole called me late that afternoon to ask me if I was bringing my son, Jason, and to see whether I could get there early to reserve a few seats. I was tied up with stuff, so I told her I probably wouldn't get there till 6 when the recital started. I also told her that I was coming alone. I don't know whether she thought I'd be bringing Paula, but I wanted to set her mind at ease, so I volunteered that information. I had decided not to bring Paula out of respect for Nicole and her family, and I'd already talked to Paula about it. Unfortunately, that conversation had not gone well. She wanted to come and didn't see why I had to keep her away from the Browns. I don't know why it's such a big deal, she said. They all know about me. I just think it's better this way, I said. It'll be easier on everyone. Paula didn't agree. She went all cold on me. I knew I was in for a lot of apologizing and a lot of damage control, but what could I do? I thought I was making the right decision. When I got to the recital, I saw Nicole and her parents, Judita and Lou. Nicole was wearing a short skirt that would have looked inappropriate on a 16-year-old. I thought she looked ridiculous, but I didn't say anything. Still, it really made me wonder. What did she see when she looked at herself in the mirror? Was her mind so muddled that she'd lost her grip on reality? I went over and said hello to everyone, and Nicole pointed at the seat she'd held for me. It was two seats away from hers. The seats in the middle were for the kids who would be running around through the evening. Nicole's sister, Denise, was in the row in front of me. She turned around and smiled a big smile and reached over and gave me a kiss. Shortly after the evening got underway, I nodded off in my chair. I don't know if you've ever been to one of these things, but they go on forever and there were probably twenty numbers before Sidney got her turn on stage. When I woke up, startled, they still hadn't made much progress, and I looked around and noticed that a lot of parents were holding nice bouquets. Damn, I had forgotten the flowers. I leaned over and checked the schedule, and there were at least half a dozen acts before Sidney hit the stage, so I worked my way down the aisle and hurried into the parking lot. I got into my car and drove into Brentwood and picked up some flowers, and I got back in plenty of time. We watched Sidney do her number and clapped louder than everyone else, and then there was a brief intermission. Sidney came over beaming, and I gave her the flowers. She looked absolutely beautiful. When she went over to talk to her grandparents, I looked up and saw Ron Fishman, Cora's husband. We shook hands, and he led me off to one side. O.J., man, you wouldn't believe what's going on, he said. With what? The women. Everybody's mad at everybody. Nicole's not talking to Cora because Cora's upset about the drug use and about the people she's hanging out with. Faye got kicked out of the house by Christian, drugs again, and ended up at Nicole's. 
than they did an intervention without even telling Christian. And for some reason, he's pissed off about that. It's a mess. It's all a huge mess. I heard a rumor Faye was messing up, I said. I don't know, he said. All I know is that they took her to rehab kicking and screaming. She wanted Nicole to go with her. She said, if I go, she needs to go because she's drinking and doing coke worse than I am. But Nicole wouldn't go. I knew this shit was going on, I said. I tried to do something about it, but Nicole wouldn't even talk about it. I know, he said. Cora told me that she tried to talk to you about it and that you said you were sick of all the bullshit. I felt a little twinge of guilt, but it passed. What's going on with you and Cora, I asked. I'm hearing some stuff. Ron looked pretty crushed for a few moments, but he pulled himself together. We split up. We'd been together for 17 years, and it's over. He didn't tell me what had split them up, and I didn't ask. Wow, I said. You're right. It's a huge mess. Yeah, he said, and I'm sure we don't know the half of it. As I worked my way back to my seat for the second part of the show, a few people came by to say hello, but I was a little distracted. I didn't like what Ron had said. We don't know the half of it. Because I knew he was right. There was a lot of weird shit happening around Nicole and those girls, and it only seemed to be getting stranger. As I sat down, I saw Nicole looking at me, like she was wondering what Ron and I had been talking about, but I didn't say a word to her. I didn't want to get into it. At some point, we were going to have to face this thing head on, and I was probably going to need her family's help, but this wasn't the time or the place for it. I was upset enough. If I talked to her now, I knew I'd just get angry. I was also very tired. I'd been in about four cities in the past week, and I had a late flight to Chicago that night for a get-together with the people at Hertz. I waited for the second half of the show to begin. That's what I was there for, after all, for my kids. I wasn't going to do anything that might ruin things for them. The second half seemed shorter, or maybe I just nutted off again. When it was over, Sidney came running over and we had our picture taken together. Then I ran into Judy, who was all smiles. Where's Nicole? she said. Aren't we going to dinner? You guys are going, I said. I ain't going. Denise came over and gave me a big kiss, and Lou showed up and shook my hand and said hello. I'm not going to dinner, I told him. I've got to stay away from your daughter. I said it with a big smile, though, as if I was horsing around, but deep down, I meant it. I did not want to be around Nicole. Much later, during the trial, this whole evening became a huge issue. For starters, the prosecution tried to suggest that I hadn't been invited to dinner, and that I was upset about it. I didn't need an invitation. It wasn't like that. If I had wanted to go to dinner, I would have gone. But I'm the one who didn't want to go. I didn't have the energy to get into anything with Nicole and I knew we'd get into it if I was there. The last time we'd talked, prior to our brief conversation earlier in the day, was when she called to scream at me about taking her friends to that fundraiser. Faye had spoken to her the next day to set the record straight, but Nicole had never bothered to apologize to me. If I was pissed off about anything, that was it. I was brought up to acknowledge my mistakes and to do something about them. Nicole had once had the same values as me, but I guess they got lost in the shuffle. So, no, I did not leave the recital upset and angry, as some people would have you believe. And I didn't think the Browns were indebted to me for all the wonderful things I'd done for them over the years, as other people suggested. Though God knows I had done an awful lot of wonderful things for them. And I wasn't in the dark mood attributed to me by several people who were at the recital, including Candace Garvey, wife of baseball Steve Garvey who got on the stand and told the court that I was simmering and looked spooky. Hell, even Denise testified that I was in a horrible mood. He looked like he wasn't there, she said. He looked like he was in space. All of this would have been very damaging, of course, except that there was a guy from Portland at the reception, and he saw me there, mingling with my family, and secretly shot a little video of me to entertain his friends back home. When the trial eventually got underway, he was back in Portland watching the proceedings on TV, and he heard all sorts of bullshit testimony about my horrible state of mind. He was a little taken aback, to say the least, so he dug up the tape and sent a copy to Los Angeles, and the defense team later played it for the court. What was I doing on the tape? I was laughing. I was cracking jokes with Lou. I was talking to Denise, who leaned over and kissed me for the second time that night, and I was horsing around with my kids. I was also doing my best to stay away from Nicole, admittedly. I wasn't going to go anywhere near that woman. 
I was sick and tired of her shit. If she wanted to take herself down, that was one thing. But I wasn't going to let her take me down with her. <laughs>